Since the time it's establishing in 1870, Deutsche Bank has excelled by facing a bigger number of challenges than different banks. These dangers have included working with people, activities, and establishments that no other bank will contact, from the Nazi party to Donald Trump. The bank's messy deeds quickened during the 1980s when it stretched out its compass to exchanging markets London and New York. Deutsche employed reckless American brokers to run its new speculation banking arm, and high chance exchanging turned into a game unto itself as opposed to an approach to serve customers. Its officials got rich. They additionally got dependent on winning. For Deutsche administrators, if an arrangement finished in cash, any methods were reasonable. In any case, the greatness long stretches of ravenousness were numbered. As government controllers educated of Deutsche's abundances, the weight became unreasonably incredible for one official, Bill Brewick Smith. In 2014, he slaughtered himself, turning into an image of the bank's dangerous institutional voracity. Chapter 1 From its establishing, Deutsche Bank set a trend for managing corrupt characters and accursed foundations. In September 1883, a train loaded with dignitaries maneuvered into Gold Creek, Montana. Standing by to meet them was Henry Villar, a German foreigner turned railroad head honcho. Villar's organization had constructed some portion of the cross country railroad and he was in Montana to nail in the formal last spike. Likewise, present to observe the procedures was the luxuriously dressed German broker Georg von Siemens. His 13-year-old bank, Deutsche, had bankrolled the railroad. Notwithstanding the grandeur, the Lars business was wrecked. Weeks after the function, it defaulted on its credits, and its speculators, including Deutsche, lost their cash. Yet, the Lars who had utilized the acquired cash to fabricate a rich chateau in Manhattan, would not own up to fault for the failure. Having lurked back to Germany, Villar made well-disposed suggestions to Siemens. Despite the cash he'd lost on Villar's wild railroad aspirations, Siemens got him. The two turned out to be dear companions. After three years, in 1886, Siemens sent Villar back to the United States to track down possible speculations for the benefit of Deutsche Bank. For a period, Things worked out in a good way, and Deutsche turned into a significant funder of the U.S. railroad range. In any case, Villar's inclination couldn't be stifled, typically, his new organization failed. Much more typically, Villar dodged the fault. Despite Villar's failings, Deutsche kept on developing, floated by European industrialization. By 1913, it was the sixth biggest bank on the planet. At the point when Hitler came to control in 1933, Deutsche turned into the main agent for the Nazi system? The bank was accountable for changing over gold taken from Holocaust casualties, including fillings removed from individuals' teeth, into money. Deutsche additionally financed the development of Auschwitz, the famous inhumane imprisonment, just as the processing plant that created Cyclone B, the toxin gas utilized in the camp's demise chambers. After the war, Deutsche Bank's destroyed Berlin home office fell under British order. Since Germany despite everything owed Britain reparations from World War I, it was to Britain's greatest advantage for a solid German bank to revive the economy. Even though the bank's wartime chief, Hermann Abs, had been indicted for atrocities, Britain let him off with a light sentence. By 1956, he was managing everything at Deutsche again. In 1970, the time of its centennial, Deutsche was German totally. It had constructed two enormous towers that ruled Frankfurt's horizon, nicknamed Charge and Credit by local people, and put resources into all the top German organizations. In the coming years, this was to change drastically. Chapter 2 As Deutsche rotated toward the advanced money-related framework, its organizational culture changed also. In 1987, Alfred Herrhausen steered at Deutsche. Propelled by money-related advancements in the United Kingdom and the United States, and the blasting economies that came about, Herrhausen purchased the British speculation bank, Morgan Grenfell, in 1989 for $1.5 billion. It was the biggest ever procurement of a speculation bank. Resulting Deutsche pioneers additionally proselytized the Anglo-American way to deal with banking. When the American bank Goldman Sachs won a pine for agreement to privatize Deutsche Telekom, the composing was on the divider. On the off chance that Wall Street was coming to Germany, at that point Germany would need to go to Wall Street. To encourage the change, Deutsche welcomed in a group of reckless American merchants who spent significant time in a dangerous new money-related development, subsidiaries. Edson Mitchell had begun his vocation doing the records for an egg ranch in Maine. Presently, 
He was the toast of Wall Street, a buckle down, the play hard soar to was mainstream with his workers and regarded by his managers. His closest companion was Bill Berwick Smith. The two had cut their teeth together at Merrill Lynch in Chicago and were specialists in the developing business sector of subordinates, items whose worth is gotten from another item. At that point, subsidiaries were being hailed as a monetary advancement that would support the two organizations and clients, simply like ATMs or 30-year contracts. Be that as it may, Wall Street banks were starting to utilize subsidiaries to take part in money-related hypotheses, which added up to wagering. It turned out to be immensely productive, and Mitchell and Berwick Smith were out of nowhere extremely well-known on Wall Street. Mitchell situated himself to lead Deutsch's push to play in the worldwide monetary markets from its London office. With a stash of $2 billion, the poached his old group from Merrill Lynch to say the very least, multiplying the workforce in the year and a half. At long last, he allured Berwick Smith over the lake with a high seven-figure yearly pay. The Americans changed the organization culture from one of the considered, traditionalist, agreement-based dynamic to the hazard-taking, reckless machismo of the original American cattle rustler. These monetary gunfighters must be prepared to effectively articulate Deutsche. They'd been telling individuals they worked at Douche Bank. The Americans likewise imparted Deutsche with contemporary Wall Street culture. The new objective? To aggregate however much individual benefit as could reasonably be expected. For brokers to need to bring in cash as anticipated. It's even fine inside an establishment, as long as there is a bringing together power guaranteeing that everybody is pulling a similar way. Without that power, however, there's the potential for the fiasco. Chapter 3 As force kept relocating toward Deutsche's denture arm, the bank began playing much dirtier. Regardless of his fame at Deutsche, also his significant pay, Broek Smith resigned in 2000. He needed, he stated, to invest more energy with his family. Be that as it may, in truth, the changing society at Deutsche had started to wear on him. One of the significant impetuses for the change was Deutsche's securing of Bankers Trust. By the 1990s, Bankers Trust, the legacy American bank, was in critical waterways. For a certain something, it had developed that its subsidiaries' bargains were outrageously misleading clients. For another, it was prone to strike dangerous arrangements, including making an unbound advance of $100 million to Donald Trump, which he never took care of. Mitchell, in the meantime, imagined that to assemble a Wall Street board business, Deutsche would need to purchase a Wall Street speculation. He proposed buying Bankers Trust. Some Deutsche insiders were stressed over purchasing a shoddy rate bank loaded with institutional decay, yet Mitchell overlooked them. In 1998, Deutsche purchased Bankers Trust for $10 billion. Before the merger, the speculation banking arm of Deutsche had acquired 29% of Deutsche's benefits. After a year, the offer was 85%. Nearby the Bankers Trust bargain, another sort of decay was spreading in Deutsche's positions. Deutsche's merchants were progressively ready to fund ventures other institutional money lenders wouldn't contact, including the land plans of Donald Trump. By the mid-1990s, Trump had just defaulted on credits worth a great many dollars with different banks. This made him radioactive with the money business, until he met Deutsche broker Mike Offit. Offit knew about Trump's notoriety, so he was eased and intrigued when Trump displayed the generally standard conduct of remembering the subtleties of the proposed bargain. Offit gave him an advance of $125 million, at that point another $300 million with the gift of Deutsche HQ. After Mitchell sacked Offit, Trump remained a Deutsche customer, adjusted by Offit protege Justin Kennedy, child of Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. A couple of years after the fact, in 2000, Deutsche's high-flying speculation bank confronted an existential mishap, Edson Mitchell, matured 47, had been murdered in a plane accident. There was a race to fill the force vacuum. Anshu Jane, a Mitchell attendant who overcompensated for his devastating uncertainty by hollering, was chosen to be his accepted substitution. Under Jane, Deutsche's deeds were dirtier than any time in recent memory. At the point when the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission started exploring Deutsche in 2001, the bank poached away from the lead specialist with a guarantee of wealth and magnificence. The case was dropped. Chapter 4 under Joe Ackerman's authority, Deutsche expected a benefit of any value mindset, while allowing its framework to infrastructure. The man who designated Anshu Jane was Joe Ackerman, a Swiss Anglophile with a frigid gaze and a propensity for numbers. Ackerman had been close with Edson Mitchell and, in 2002, 
he was named the first since forever CEO of Deutsche Bank. A numbers fixated pioneer is useful for a bank. Be that as it may, Ackerman would in the general spotlight on benefit, and benefit as it were. At the point when he initially came to control, Ackerman's need was to turn around an ongoing downslide of Deutsche's stock. So he sold its proprietorship stake in different German organizations and appropriated the returns to investors. Some Deutsche onlookers were stunned, on account of an emergency, the cash would be more secure in the bank than in the pockets of investors. Ackerman did it in any case. Ackerman honed in on a solitary measurement, return on value. Generally, return on value is a rate proportion of how much benefit interest in Deutsche would return over a given year. Under Ackerman, the entire organization was relied upon to stick to the speculation banking ethos, lucrative was all that made a difference, and any choice that could decrease benefits ought to be delayed. Deutsche's reward remuneration framework was acclimated to mirror the new reality. A few dealers left with $30 million checks toward the year's end. The fixation on benefit drove Deutsche down some dim streets. Under Ackerman, Deutsche started piping cash to systems under monetary approvals, including Syria, Iran, North Korea, and Sudan. Representatives were prepared in counter-surveillance to dodge identification by global law implementation. Ackerman's interest with Russia likewise made some future issues for the bank. In 2006, Deutsche gained a Russian stock exchanging business whose customers included law-avoiding oligarchs. Around a similar time, Deutsche expanded a $1 billion credit line to Russia's VTB Bank, an administration-controlled loan specialist with binds to Russian knowledge. At the same time, Deutsche's PC frameworks were getting progressively divided. This implied the bank had no real way to gauge or comprehend what it was doing. More awful, there was no real way to fix it. One official said that it would resemble changing a motor mid-flight. Regardless of whether bringing together the PC frameworks had been a simple possibility, it would have been costly, and that made it unsatisfactory to Ackerman. Chapter 5 Trump had consumed different banks previously, however, Deutsche was so enthusiastic for development that it worked with him at any rate. Deutsche's work with anybody approach didn't simply incorporate bomb states and despots. The bank kept on working with reckless New York land big name Donald Trump. Justin Kennedy was Trump's go-to person at Deutsche. He advocated Trump's petitions for progressively huge land advances through the bank and went with Trump to Manhattan clubs and soirees. The biggest of these advances came in 2005 when Deutsche loaned Trump $640 million to fabricate an extravagance tower in Chicago. Trump was an awful venture. He had a background marked by defaults on Wall Street and even insulted speculators that he may quit taking care of his advances. In any case, what he needed the marketing prudence, he compensated for in dramatic artistry. He employed a gathering of Deutsche financiers to raise money for his disturbed Trump hotel and casinos resorts, promising them an end of the week at his Florida golf club, Mar-a-Lago, on the off chance that they succeeded. They sold $485 million in garbage bonds, and after a few updates, Trump sent his plane to bring 15 sales reps to Palm Beach. The following year, Trump sought financial protection, and the speculators who had purchased the garbage bonds endured agonizing misfortunes. I don't believe it's a disappointment, Trump said. It's a triumph. Meanwhile, Trump worked with different parts of the bank. He lubed the wheels on the $640 million credits with trips on his jet, blessings, and applause. The arrangement experienced even though Deutsche bookkeepers found that Trump's total assets were about a fourth of what he had asserted. His relationship with Deutsche unmistakably profited Trump, particularly given the absolute bottom loan fees the bank was charging him. In any case, Trump was useful for Deutsche, as well. Back in the early aughts, it was as yet a German bank battling for name acknowledgement in the United States. Trump was a TV star, and the spotlight shone on Deutsche by affiliation. The relationship before long soured however. At the pinnacle of the money-related emergency in 2008, Trump owed Deutsche $334 million, which he had no aim of repaying. His legal advisor summoned power measure, a dark agreement provision that typically relates to a catastrophic event. They guaranteed that the financial emergency was, similar to a tropical storm or a seismic tremor, a demonstration of God, and consequently, the agreement was invalid. In any case, Trump didn't stop there. A couple of days after the fact, Trump sued Deutsche, blaming them for savage loaning rehearses. He requested harms of $3 billion. That did it. Deutsche disavowed Trump, for now, at any rate.
Chapter 6, Deutsche Bank endured the Great Recession because of karma and ploy. There wasn't a lot of affection lost between Anshu Jain and Joe Ackerman. Ackerman didn't believe Jane and normally abused him to board individuals despite his good faith. As far as concerns him, Jane's idea he was placing in all the difficult work while Ackerman swanned around at state suppers. Be that as it may, the two administrators shared one significant thing for all intents and purpose, they realized how to bring in cash. The difficulty was, that was all they realized how to do. Jane was certifiably not a decent pioneer or a capable official. He shouted at subordinates and didn't take contradiction well. Be that as it may, for Jane and his group, the finishes advocated the methods. It didn't make a difference how the cash was coming in, as long as it was coming. This attitude would place the bank in an advantageous position as it confronted its most genuine emergency yet, the breakdown of the U.S. lodging market, which set off the supposed Great Recession. Paving the way to the downturn, it was practically incomprehensible not to bring in cash. Loan costs were near zero, so banks could obtain a lot of cash for hardly anything. All they needed to do at that point was to discover resources that delivered more noteworthy returns than the intrigue they needed to pay. In the long run, the proportion of Deutsch's advantages that were acquired to its capital arrived at 50 to 1. By examination, most banks drifted around 20 to 1. This proportion stayed viable just in so far as the economy kept on developing. What's more, develop it did, alongside Deutsche. In 2007 Deutsche turned into the biggest bank on the planet, with $2 trillion on its asset report, about a similar size as the whole German economy. Ackerman and Jane persuaded themselves they were acceptable, not fortunate. In any case, in August 2007, at a yearly gathering in Barcelona, Jane was anxious. He and his lieutenants were shaken by indications of a get-together financial tempest. In a move that likely spared the bank, he trained his groups to auction their most dangerous situations in the U.S. lodging market. They were secured, however the tempest despite everything hit. Frantic for help, Jane called Bill Broek Smith, beseeching him to help Deutsche secure everything. Broek Smith, exhausted with retirement, concurred. On the whole, Deutsche was the main bank that figured out how to benefit during the hour of the downturn, or appear to, at any rate. Notwithstanding Jane's initial fortunate turn of events, Deutsche dealers rubbed the books to disguise that they were all the while sitting on heaps of poisonous subordinates, concealing billions in misfortunes. In any case, those misfortunes wouldn't remain covered up until the end of time. Chapter 7 Entrusted with tackling Deutsche's issues, Bill Broek Smith felt progressively distanced from the business he'd assisted with building up. Gradually, controllers figured out what was happening behind Deutsche's shut entryways. In the initial eight months of 2013, Deutsche handled 5,777 solicitations for data, around one consistently. A British specialist brought a duty misrepresentation body of evidence against Deutsche. Rather than ending the illicit conduct, Deutsche moved its racket to Germany. When the Germans constrained Deutsche to reassess, they had cheated the two governments out of about $250 million. Likewise, Controllers were tired of being viewed as wrist slappers who forced generally little fines on managers an account with billions of dollars to play with. They got extreme and started passing on fines in the billions. Much of the time, Bill Broek Smith attempted to stop rehearses that swung among boldly and somewhat criminal. Quite often, he was either overlooked or transparently derided. Broek Smith had consistently been the fence for Mitchell's wild exchanging rehearses. Be that as it may, those days were a distant memory. In 2009, Broek Smith tested Troy Dixon, a reckless youthful New York broker, over his hazardous exchanges. Subsequently, Broek Smith was made a figure of fun by Dixon's group. Eventually, Dixon's work cost Deutsche $541 million and raised warnings with controllers. The following outrage came in 2012 when two of Broek Smith's advancements were torpedoed by German controllers for political reasons. Rather, he was allocated a seat on the leading group of a dark Deutsche arm in the United States that was the dumping ground for hazardous arrangements, similar to the advances to Trump. Broek Smith was shocked by what he discovered there, a clutter of woefully insufficient innovation and head in the sand brokers uninterested with surrounding controllers. His activity was to unravel this titanic chaos. Deutsche's speculation arm, the piece of the business Broek Smith had worked with his perished closest companion Edson Mitchell was currently the base of its difficulties. More terrible, it turned out to be evident that U.S. and British controllers were focusing in on him. Surprisingly, 
as the subject of an examination of misbehavior. They had summoned the tape of a call he'd been on, during which he'd conceded that Deutsche had been effectively avoiding billions in charges. He felt cornered, compelled to protect a foundation where he did not accept any more. In January 2014, Broek Smith draped himself with his canine's rope. He left self-destruction notes routed to his family and Anshu Jane. Chapter 8 Anshu Jane's renunciation was a harbinger of another time of retribution and rebuilding at Deutsche Bank. In the wake of Broek Smith's passing, Jane and other Deutsche VIPs were left to settle on extreme choices about the fate of the bank without his consistent hand. Deutsche's issues with controllers had scared speculators, and the stock cost was at its absolute bottom ever. It didn't appear as though there was an end in sight. By 2015, there were more than 7,000 remarkable lawful activities against Deutsche everywhere throughout the world. Billions in fines were approaching. When one more fine descended, for $2.5 billion, Jane overlooked the theme on a call with the board. The board individuals were paralyzed. This wasn't a pioneer they could trust in attempting times. Jane recognized what would be inevitable and surrendered in 2015. Jane's ouster didn't end Deutsche's hardships, yet it showed that the bank was, finally, reacting to inconveniences too genuine to be in any way disregarded. For a certain something, Deutsche kept on discharging cash. The business had cottoned on to the way that Deutsche wasn't worth what it asserted it was. Billions of the bank's advantages were still in subordinates, which, after the 2008 accident, were useless. Financial specialists kept on escaping at disturbing rates, driving the stock cost even lower. Surprisingly more dreadful, in 2015, Barack Obama's Justice Department required a fine of $7 billion against Deutsche for cheating financial specialists, the biggest punishment at any point forced on a bank. A radical rebuilding was required if the bank would endure. In 2018, the board disposed of Jane's replacement and delegated one more new CEO. Their decision, Christian Sewing, was a young-looking German who had been with the bank for all intents and purposes since secondary school. Decades sooner, he had cautioned against Deutsche wandering excessively far from its legacy as an apathetically moderate German bank. Presently he suggested radically cutting the speculation arm of the bank which Edson Mitchell had demonstrated after the go-go firms in London and New York. The workforce would be decreased by 20%. Deutsche had at long last gotten its name acknowledgement in the United States, yet for all inappropriate reasons. Russian oligarchs with something to stow away had since quite a while ago realized that Deutsche's Moscow branch was the go-to place to launder their cash. In 2014, government examiners got mindful of the alleged laundromat, and, in 2017, Columnists broke the story to the general population. Also, Deutsche's relationship with Trump had caused issues down the road for it in a major manner. Chapter 9 Millions in advance from Deutsche, and a related facade of authenticity, helped Trump become a U.S. president. Deutsche's legitimate ensnarement with Donald Trump extended into 2010 when the bank consented to let him free for a $40 million level rate. Trump more likely than not been truly glad. That was about $300 million short of what he owed. Be that as it may, he despite everything didn't have the cash. Jared Kushner, by then Trump's child-in-law, acquainted Trump with his broker, Rosemary Verblick of Deutsche. Verblick got her beginning working for an Israeli bank gaining practical experience in tax evasion and had become famous by carrying gigantic new customers to Deutsche. Trump approached Verblick for a $50 million credit from Deutsche's private bank to take care of what he owed to the venture arm. Energetic for a major new customer, Verblick pushed the arrangement through. It was an exceptional move for a bank. Be that as it may, things were going to get considerably more abnormal. In resulting years, Deutsche helped Trump purchase a green in Miami and rent a memorable structure in Washington, D.C. The last turned into the Trump International Lavish Inn found only a couple of squares from the White House. Deutsche again gave him incredibly low financing costs and started stretching out advances and credit lines to his family also. In 2015, seven days after Jane Souster, Trump rode the brilliant elevator down to the campaign of Trump Tower to declare his bid for president. Deutsche would keep on supporting him all through the sharp battle. This help came as cash. In the crusade, for which he was to a great extent paying with his cash, Trump inquired as to whether he could take another credit from Deutsche to renegotiate his Miami fairway. The appropriate response was yes. Be that as it may. Trump likewise profited politically from his relationship with Deutsche. Confronted with claims that he was untouchable in the budgetary world, 
Trump highlighted his relationship with the bank and alluded columnist of Roblick, whom he incorrectly asserted was Deutsche Bank's CEO. At the point when Trump was chosen, alarmed Deutsche officials attempted to see how the U.S. president-elect had come to owe them $350 million. A simple answer wasn't imminent. They in the end accused the organization's out-of-date innovation and compartmentalized offices, just as the ruining impact of the Americans. The most serious issue currently was that the U.S. president by and by owed a huge number of dollars to a remote bank, over which his organization held colossal force. If Trump somehow managed to default, the bank would have the terrible decision of either holding on to the president's very own advantages or making an enormous, unintended individual gift. Neither would place the bank in a complimenting light. Chapter 10, Val's Store of Inside Deutsche Bank Archives Shed Light on Deutsche's Grimy Deeds, and Bill's Self-Destruction A considerable lot of the difficulties that spooky Deutsche Bank in the years after Bill Proek-Smith's demise was unsurprising. Yet, one issue lingered that was practically difficult to anticipate, considerably less control, Valentin Proek-Smith. Val was Bill's stepson, and his life had been troublesome. He'd went through years in childcare before Bill embraced him. As a grown-up, he took a shot at an off as a performer, celebrated hard, and lived off his dad's largesse. At the point when Bill executed himself, Val got fixated on discovering why. The night after Bill kicked the bucket, Val began looking around on Bill's PC and replicated down a rundown of passwords he'd found. Taking a gander at Bill's email represent pieces of information, Val additionally found that Bill had sent several messages from his work account. This file would turn into Val's meat and potatoes for the following five years. What's more, it's the essential explanation we presently know the degree of Deutsche Bank's corrupted endeavors. The day after Bill passed on, Deutsche delegates visited the family to give sympathies. One agent demonstrated incredible enthusiasm for Bill's PC and made duplicates of the hard drive. They taught Bill's family to express nothing to the press. Five months after Bill passed on, Val reached creator David and Rich at that point a correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, for help figuring out the immense number of reports. And Hans focused in on one report specifically. In it, the U.S. Federal Reserve blames Deutsche for disgraceful strategic approaches. At the point when the story came out, Deutsche's stock fell 3%. Val enjoyed this sentiment of intensity. Looking further, Val discovered proof connecting Bill's demise to his unpleasant activity. These included letters from Bill's PCPs enumerating his serious nervousness because of the examinations. He likewise discovered adaptations of the specialist's notes, later discharged to general society, that had been redacted and revamped by Deutsche legal advisors. It appeared that Bill had disguised a considerable lot of Deutsche's issues. As things began turning out badly at a quicker clasp, the wages turned out to be excessive. In 2019, Val offered the records to Adam Schiff the administrator of the Intelligence Committee examining Russia's inclusion in Trump's political race. By that point, he knew the estimation of the archives and wasn't going to release them for anything. At last, Schiff needed to give a summon to make Val surrender them. The archives affirmed what many had since quite a while ago suspected about Deutsche Bank, and about Bill Bruick Smith, the man who passed on for its wrongdoings. Be that as it may, Deutsche Bank didn't murder Bruick Smith. Through many years of guiltiness, pomposity, and carelessness, the bank slaughtered itself. Dark Towers, Deutsche Bank, Donald Trump, and an epic trail of destruction by David and Rich Book Review. Deutsche Bank's defilement, pomposity, and unbridled avarice have released ruinous results on the account business, the worldwide economy, and the U.S. administration, also the individual Deutsche workers who need to live with themselves. The bank is rebuilding, apparently to abstain from rehashing its past mix-ups, however, the harm it has fashioned can't be fixed.